everyone. This is Dr. or Bishop Brian Willett, whichever one you prefer, coming to you live from the foothills, the Appalachian Mountains on this August 24th, 2018, for Vestiges After Dark. Tonight, the subject is aliens. It's a topic that so many of you have been asking about on Twitter, and you know I draw from Twitter, as I should, all of the uh, interesting questions that you have and the subject matter that you would like me to cover. So tonight, the subject is exotheology. What does that mean for religion? What does it mean for how we view the universe as believers in God or otherwise? This and more today, tonight, whatever it is for you. Yes, it's just after dark. Stay tuned. This edition of Vestiges After Dark. I see that the chat room is um, livening up, so we're ready to start taking questions um, immediately. Actually, if you want to just start posting whatever th m thoughts might be on your mind concerning this topic tonight, exotheology and uh, the general subject matter of aliens, um, and Joy Keeling, my co host. We'll be monitoring all of your questions so that we don't miss anything, as well as also anything that came in on Twitter. I think only one did, but we will get to that one, too, uh, most likely on the second hour. Um, but I want to thank all of you for making this show after just uh, three, two, three episodes. I think just two episodes. How many has it been, Joy? I'm not even sure now. Is I, I think this is the third. The third. After okay, dark. That sounds yeah. about, okay, that sounds about right. So... After just th uh, two episodes, uh, uh, really, that have aired, it's already so much more popular than Vestiges of Christianity. Maybe part of that's the time slot. Maybe part of that has to do with the fact that it is more neutral of a title. Um, I'm not really sure. This is more of a paranormal focus, and I know that a lot of you are very much interested in that, and there's a larger range of, of, of interested audience members. So... We're right now looking at double the listenership on this show than uh, what we see on uh, Vestiges of Christianity. So I want to thank all of you for making that possible. Please get the word out about us. If you like this show, um, you can help us by donating, which we really could use monthly support. But um, it also helps us if you just retweet um, anytime we mention the show with hashtag Vestiges After Dark. And uh, hashtag Nicolayan Radio. That will get the word out. Tell them how great the show is. Um, every time, if you follow me, which is at Exorcist Bishop on Twitter, um, and you can also uh, follow Joy, uh, which is at J Joy Keeling, um, you can always get updates as to the shows uh, that are coming up, uh, as well as the immediate live link so that you can connect immediately into the show and start listening to it. We are also available um, to be found, you, you could say, on Google Play. Um, we're on iTunes. 
Uh, we're on YouTube, and you can even listen live directly at the church's website at nicolan.org or esotericcatholic.org. We're also um, not quite yet on iHeartRadio. Vestiges of Christianity is, but uh, Vestiges After Dark will be showing up there uh, in a couple more episodes. I think we need five or six to be able to qualify uh, for iHeartRadio. So once we've had that, um, then you can look for us there as well. So it's really good, I think, really uh, uh, positive, and I thank you all for making that uh, possible because this show is really for you. It's a way of my being able to communicate to all of you who are loyal uh, followers on Twitter and, uh, and various other elements of my social media uh, platforms. You know, a way of being able to c talk to you and spend time with you and communicate with you better than what social media allows and uh, hopefully you're enjoying this show as much as I am enjoying being able to offer it and uh, it's really um, really great to see um, the response so far so please keep it up get the word out and uh, we'll be uh, sure to be giving you many many uh, more shows to come but uh, tonight um, it is about exo theology um, and, you know, we're going to be handling this uh, mostly from the alien side of the perspective because there's just so many ways in which we can explore this topic. And um, religion hasn't always traditionally done the best job with it. Uh, in fact, in many ways, religion has been threatened by it. And it really shouldn't be. Um, but we tend to be a very geocentric civilization um, even though we have moved beyond geocentrism as a um, scientific philosophy, we tend to still feel as though we are the center of the universe, even if it's not just the planet. Some people suffer from very extreme forms of egocentrism. In fact, I would say that most people do and think the world revolves around them. Um, so it's not completely out of the question to think that the world uh, is the center of the universe because it's the center of our universe, and that's how, or that's the worldview, I guess you could say, uh, that religion spawned out of. So it's no surprise that religion still tends to hold a very geocentric view of the universe, um, while science has given us a lot more to think about. But not all theologians, in fact, most very serious theologians um, find the subject of exotheology to be quite fascinating and interesting. So tonight we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about some of my own personal experiences with uh, alien phenomenon because, believe it or not, as an exorcist, I do sometimes get clients that report to me encounters that they think are demonic when they are actually uh, more in line with what would be a classic um, alien abduction scenario. And uh, we'll even, for those of you who are not familiar with that, although I would imagine if you're listening to this show, you probably are somewhat familiar with what alien abduction is and the elements that go along with it. There's been many movies made about the subject and there's no shortage of material out there in which to read about it. So if you're interested in the paranormal, chances are very good that you've encountered at least a basic understanding of the alien abduction phenomena. So we're going to talk about all of this. And I've actually had personal experiences with this, not just with clients, but also before I became an exorcist in my own personal life. I want to talk about that as well. Um, and I want to talk about the issues from the, relig the religious standpoint, because there's a lot to discuss, and it comes back to, uh, ultimately, who are, alien who are the aliens? Do they even exist? These are the questions we're going to tackle tonight. But first, let's talk to see how, let's first see how, how Joy's doing. How are you doing <laughs> tonight, Joy? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. All right. You ready for this topic? I'm as ready as I can be. <laughs> Have you ever had any encounters with aliens or UFOs or anything like that? Not personally. And <clears throat> I've known people who have. 
Um, there was one who, you know, I, you know, I, I, I had never really heard about somebody being abducted and healed, but that was what she said happened to her as a, as a child. And I thought that was one of the neatest stories. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, but I, I never really got to encounter anything on my own, although I wanted to, um, there's a, a UFO watchtower in Colorado, uh, state where I'm at. Um, it's, uh, just a watchtower in the middle of a valley and the woman who built it initially built it as a joke, but then people, you know, she'd be having a party or something and people would see stuff. So then she just made it a, a UFO watchtower for everybody to come to because, Hey, apparently there's UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, she has this little, like an igloo on, on the site um, where the watchtower is. And it has like the history of the place and all the articles about the place. So it's it's quite a, a little tourist attraction in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, that's actually kind of cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really actually quite cool. And, and they know, offer I, camping, too. Do they really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's actually kind of the best place to go. You know, UFO <laughs> hunting would be, you know, in the deep forest somewhere. Um, away from, you know, city lights or away from the hustle and bustle of ordinary human civilization, you tend to start to see things out there. Having lived in Las Vegas, um, actually twice, um, I, I moved out there, moved away, moved back several years later and then moved away again. Um, hopefully there'll be a third time and final time because I really would like to return there for good if that is at all possible but, um, you know, when you get out there into Las Vegas and, and there's really not much outside of the Las Vegas area, you really have to kind of travel uh, in any direction to get to anywhere else. Uh, it's not like normal cities in most places. You know, your Vegas is really in the middle of the desert and there's not much around it and not much was really built up outside of the little fishbowl. Um, I call it the fishbowl because Vegas is basically surrounded by mountains, which tends to cause a problem when it rains because all the water comes rushing down the mountains and tends to flood the strip. In fact, I think every year I lived there, um, there was, and this is no lie, there was a news report that somebody drowned on the strip, a tourist drowned on the strip. And you're thinking, how is that even possible? Oh, my gosh. Um and it's because the flash floods are so crazy there. When it really does rain, it doesn't rain often, but when it does, it comes down in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a vengeance because oh, you got all this water um, flooding down the sides of the mountains into the valley. Um, and it can be quite dangerous if you're not uh, prepared for it. Uh, Vegas is a little bit better now than it was in uh, many, many years ago because now it has like flood flood control and that helps a bit but there's still incidences that do occur um but yeah you it's it's in the middle of nowhere is the point i'm trying to make and when you go out away from the city you're in the middle of nothing and um you see things and of course you know you got area 51 which doesn't help the matter and there is something a little unusual and mysterious about that place even outside of the um, the fact that it is obviously a government facility and they don't really talk about too much about what goes on there. There's an interesting, you know, little uh, unmarked plane that uh, flies into McCarran Airport uh, every day and picks up all of the employees that live in Las Vegas who work at Area 51 and flies them in uh, and then they fly them back home. Um, and, uh, you know, they can't talk about whatever went on there um so you know th there's a, there's a mystique to it and you know vegas is a great location for the whole uh, alien hunter type of uh, of a person it really <laughs> is <laughs> and yes um people are talking about phoenix absolutely and you know the 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 most recent ufo experiences i've had were actually driving f away from las vegas into arizona at night and then returning incidentally um you'd always see very strange things in the sky although i've seen things in my youth that were more fascinating than that um i haven't really had any 
um, UFO encounters in recent years that were remarkable other than the fact that I've seen strange things in the sky and really couldn't explain what I, it was that I saw. Um, but I, I would like to talk about one of my first experiences with with uh, this subject matter, which first got me interested in this to the point that it's worth doing a show about. Uh, when I was a young child, we're talking, uh, I want to say four years old. Okay, so this was a long time ago. And um, I want to say Pinocchio was in the drive-in. Um, and drive-ins were a lot more common then than they were than they are now. Um, was that... <laughs> I remember those. Yeah, they, they were. They would always, you know, throw me in the trunk and sneak me in because I was little. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always pay by the car, so it didn't matter. <laughs> you could stuff the car with six people, and it was the same price if you went by yourself. Um, but um, I, I, you know, I, I guess there were some that would pay, you know, charge you by how many people were in the car, but. Um, we went to this to see this this movie. It was actually the first movie I had ever seen. Uh, so the first movie I ever went to out that was not at home was not actually in a real conventional movie theater, but at a drive-in. And we went to see Pinocchio, and it was late. And I remember falling asleep during it because it was so late. And you know, we the cars back then were nice and big and comfy, and um, you know, I. You, you didn't <laughs> seat belts were sort of an afterthought and you can just kind of sprawl out and fall asleep in the back seat. And some of my best memories from childhood are doing that very thing. Um, so, you know, the movie ended and we were driving home and um, I remember waking up to my father having a sort of, uh, how can I describe it? His voice seemed, disturbed and almost excitedly disturbed and i and you know you know how when you know somebody and you, you know you know someone really really well their inflections change and you can just tell something's wrong just by their inflection just by the way they're talking you can just tell something's wrong and i'm coming out of this sort of twilight um you know being four years old but i remember this very well i have a remarkable memory of my um of my childhood, I can remember things, many, many things from going as far back as one and a half to two. So four is very vivid in my memory. Um, I can remember a lot from that period of time. And, and so I remember waking up and hearing my father's voice seemed disturbed and it alarmed me because I knew that he didn't talk like that unless there was something very wrong. And I remember him saying to my mother, they were still thinking I was asleep. You know, there it is again. There it is again. Um, and now it's on that side now. And I, I was like, what are they talking about? You know, I really didn't really, I didn't know at all what it was that was going on, but I knew it was something that w was alarming and it sort of frightened me a little bit. Um, and so I asked them, you know, I woke up, I said, what's going on? And my mother basically just uh, wrote it off and said, don't worry about it. Just go back to sleep. You know, it's nothing. It's nothing. So we eventually, I didn't go back to sleep. And I know that my dad was still kind of looking up and we lived in a semi rural area. It wasn't it was, you know, kind of the extension of a suburb, but we were in the woods and there was a lot of natural area around and so we, we eventually drove up into our driveway where my my dad says to my mother, you know, stay in the car with Brian. And I'm going to get out because, you know, he was obviously still looking up at the sky and very much disturbed and alarmed by whatever it was that was going on that I still did not understand or know. And he goes out there and um, I see him pick up like a rock. Uh, and he throws it into the sky. I'm like, what is this guy doing? You know, what is my dad doing? Um, and he kind of stayed out there for a little bit and we're just watching him and he's out there in this field. We had this big field on the side of the house with nothing there and it was just woods surrounding it. Um, and then he came back and he said, he said to my mother something about it being gone and it just took off. And he, he said he hit it with a rock and I'm like, hit what with a rock? And so, um, they never told me anything about it, but I remember several years later, I mean, they, at that point, they didn't tell me anything about it. But several years later, I, you know, I think I was probably about seven or eight at this point. 
where I talked to my dad and I said, um, what was that? You know, that, what was that all about back then? Because I remember something about this going on, but I'm not quite sure. And I could be getting some of the dates wrong. It's been a long time. But, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood, it was a few years later, and they finally told me. And so he says to me that um, when they were driving home, when we were all driving home from the movie, there was a UFO that was following the car at a very low altitude. Um, he estimated it to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 or 200 feet to very close to the ground. You're talking like, you know, between 10 and 20 stories. And it was massive. Like he described it to be sort of almost like a, um, uh, well, uh, like a, like a giant, uh, I don't know if he, I, I don't know if he, it was as large as like a aircraft carrier, but it was like very, very large, um, floating, um, uh, object that did not make a sound. Uh, I don't remember if it had lights or we'd have to like bring him on the air at some point and maybe he can tell the story because he was the one that saw it. I didn't. And he, um, he, when he left the car, it was just there hovering over the house. It followed us all the way home. It was there hovering over the house. And he picked up a rock and was able to throw it, and it was close enough that he could hit it. And as soon as he hit the object with the rock, it just shot out into, into the sky at a rapid speed. It was like instantaneously gone. And um, that encounter made my father an extremely um, vivid believer of this type of thing. That even to this day, there's no question in his mind that UFOs are real. And of course, the assumption is always that they are aliens. They're an alien spacecraft or something that's coming from another planet to visit us or, you know, to explore us. Observe what we do. I mean, there's lots of possibilities that we'll get into here in a moment, but that was the first thing that, um, that in my earliest memory that I can recall. And uh, I do want to say that I remember seeing lights in the sky, but I'm not entirely sure about that. I can't tell if that was because I was told what that was being seen and it kind of became imprinted in my memory or whether or not I actually saw that. I'm not really clear on that point. We'd have to, again, bring him on the air and talk to him about the firsthand uh, 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 account. But um, that was enough to really sort of bring my family into this mode of thinking that these were real. And I had an uncle that was on my mother's side that was very into the whole UFO thing. And remember, this was very close to the time where there were uh, several UFO lights that had hovered over the power plants. I want to say this was like the early 70s, maybe 73, 74, where they had hovered over the eastern seaboard power plants and there was a massive blackout that knocked out the entire eastern uh, power grid. And uh, there were reports in the news about there were several lights seen floating above the power grid and before it went out. Um, so there was a lot of interest in this in the 70s, and my uncle was very much into it. Um, but then several years later, the idea of alien abductions began. And this was this thing where, you know, you know about the Close Encounters, right? Everyone's seen the movie, I would imagine, Close Encounters of the, th of the Third Kind. Um, and a lot of people don't know what those um, uh, Close Encounter uh, designations mean um, because, you know, we, we only know the movie. Um, but there's actually um, four kinds of encounters um, with with aliens, and the third kind uh, is actually what what actually goes on in the movie is really a fourth kind. <laughs> it's not actually the third kind, um, but I guess nobody cared about it because you know uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, a movie and people are just happy to see it. And it was a, actually a pretty damn good movie, if you ask me. Uh, um, but I, I you know. 
the fourth kind is when um, you actually make contact with an alien being or an alien being actually makes contact with you um, to the point that there is like a an abduction scenario. And if you recall in the movie, Barry, the little boy in that movie, who is about the same age as me, incidentally, so I ident- identified with him, um, he's abducted. You know, they bring him back. They're good aliens, I guess you could say. Um, but there's several kinds. So there's the four, there's there's close encounters of the first kind, which is when you have a visual sighting of an unidentified uh, object, and you don't know what it is. Um, so what my dad encountered that night would be considered a, a close encounter of the first kind. Um, a second kind encounter is when there is some kind of physical effect left behind. A, you, this would be sort of like the crop uh, circles where there's like radiation, residual radiation that's left behind after people see uh, flying saucers or some type of UFO type object hovering over the fields. And then there's uh, a crop circle that appears the next morning. People have recorded um, scorching. People have recorded uh, various other types of effects in the environment. So that would be like a second a close encounter of the second kind. Um, but a close encounter of the third kind is when you actually get to see uh, an alien. So this would be like those times when you see like, you know, people that report being in their home. Maybe it's like a cabin home somewhere in a remote location. They see lights or something outside. They go and they look and they can see um, maybe an alien spacecraft that's landed and some type of being departing from the spaceship. Um, that would be a close and kind of the, th- of the, of the third kind. But the fourth is when you start to get into this abduction. And some people have even proposed that there's a fifth and sixth, I think even a seventh kind. Um, but those get a little bit crazy. Um, fifth kind is when people report receiving communications from them. Um, Sixth kind uh, is when they, when the person is. It, it, I, I want to say it's when they never come back. They're they're abducted, but they're abducted. Somebody can confirm that they saw the abduction, but the person goes missing and is never comes back, or it is found dead, or something like that. And then there's a seventh kind encounter, where this is where you start to get into the whole alien hybrid thing. Where they're mixing our, they're they're harvesting our genetic material for some type of experiment, God knows what. So you know, it's an interesting range of possibilities, and um, you know, my family was fascinated with the subject because of their own personal encounters with it, and there were other things that had happened in my childhood that were a little bit less remarkable than that first one. Um, and I don't want to get into each and every story because that would be a show in itself. Um, but suffice it to say for now, my interest was piqued, um, because I've always been more of a rational thinker. I've always tried to understand that, you know, when there's something that doesn't seem right or something that doesn't seem viable, there's usually a valid, reasonable explanation that we just haven't discovered yet. So I always try to keep, keep in mind the possibility of it being something more mundane. Um, However, that was easy to do when I was only hearing about these encounters from family members or other people I knew. That changed when I had my own. So my first encounter where I actually saw it, I was the only one that saw what it was uh, in my teenage years. I want to say I was uh, 16 I was driving in, uh, I would have been in Massachusetts, and it was in the daytime. And I remember being on the highway, and all the roads in Massachusetts are like 55, so you go ver- terribly slow. Cops are everywhere, so there's no speeding, otherwise you're going to get a ticket. So everyone, you know, going really slow, and we're just kind of like, you know, 55 feels really slow when you live, uh, you know, in areas out west where you can go, <laughs> you know, 75, 80 in, in some cases. Um, 55 is really very slow 
And so I'm looking, ar- I'm looking up at the sky, and I noticed that there was this cloud that didn't seem right. So it caught my attention. I started looking at it, and I noticed that while I was looking at the cloud, there was this um, spherical, again, sort of an elongated, not quite a cigar shape, almost like a hot dog. You know how like a hot dog in a bun sort of like curves on the end, so it's yeah. not a straight line, but it's sort of like. It has this curvature to it. It had that kind of appearance. It was sort of circular and round, but it was long. And I'm looking up, and I'm seeing this thing move from cloud to cloud. And it just and it seems to be following. But this was higher up. You know, this was at cloud level. So we're now we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of five thousand to maybe ten thousand feet. And uh, it's just going back and forth between the clouds. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, what is that? And I was alone. So I couldn't say, you know, to somebody in the car, you know, what's going on there? What do you see? Um, But it lasted for several minutes. Then it just took off. And again, you know, that would be close encounter of the first kind. Um, But then when I moved to Las Vegas the second time, I then had my first serious encounter. And this is where it changed my opinion of this phenomenon because it was very personal and very authentic and I'm going to share that with you now uh, because I think it's good material for this particular show before we get into some of the um, exotheology and you know some of the uh, you know questions that you've guy you guys have had about it regarding you know how the church looks at it and I've you know I want to definitely cover that today tonight but um I'm now in Las Vegas. This would have been around 2003, um, 2003, 2004, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, And I uh, was, at this point, very much still a practicing Buddhist. And part of my daily spiritual practice was meditation. So I spent a great deal of time back in those days. You know, it was a little bit difficult because I was working Um, when I was in college. I was I was meditating close to four hours a day, uh, which was a which is a lot to most people. um, But it was very normal to me. And um, when I was in Las Vegas, I tried to maintain that regimen, but it was harder because my job, my my work schedule was a little bit more demanding than my college schedule where I had a lot more freedom. And while I was meditating this afternoon, um, I would always set a, uh, I had a chime, sort of a meditation alarm type of thing that would go off and slowly bring me out of the meditation so that I wouldn't go too long. Because I, I like I said, I, I've been very used to meditating four hours, uh, which can be very easy for me. And, um, you know, I would lose myself in the meditation and not necessarily keep track. Or time seems to change when you get into these deeper states of consciousness. So I would always set myself a, an alarm so that I, when, it, when I needed to be done with it, I didn't accidentally go over. And so the char- the first chime goes off, and that's when I start to slowly bring myself out of the meditation. I start to notice, you know, my my surroundings. I start to connect again with my corporeal nature, being aware of my body and 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 and, and the various sensations of physicality around me. Then helps to bring you back from this much more ethereal state that you can reach in some of these deeper levels of Buddhist meditation. And w- at one point in this part of the waking up process, you open your eyes. And as soon as I did that, there was, and I kid you not, a classic archetypal gray alien standing over me looking into my face. I kid you not. It startled the hell out of me as you can imagine it probably would anyone because you know this has never happened to me but in all the years i had been meditating never encountered this before and i 
jolted away. I mean, jolted up. <laughs> it was like I, I, I threw away the rest of my, you know, normal waking up process or coming out of the meditation. I, I hesitate to call it waking up because, I mean, you're, you're very much awake in meditation. You don't really lose consciousness. You, your consciousness changes, but you're very much aware and awake. And so, you know, coming out of that state, um, I threw it all away and just came to normal consciousness immediately and stood up, you know, sat up. Because I was li- I was actually lying down in bed. Some of that some of my meditation I would do in the in a semi lotus position. I find the lotus position to be uh, very uncomfortable to get into, um, but the semi lotus tends to be quite comfortable. And then some of the, my meditations I will do laying down. And so I came I, I, I sat and it was gone. So I thought for a moment that maybe this was just a you know, some kind of ca- after image again, my rational mind starts kicking in, doesn't want to believe it, doesn't want to accept it, doesn't want to, you know, fully embrace the possibility of what it seems. But it did strike me. And I was left unsettled. The next day, I was doing the exact same meditation in the exact same location in the exact same way and this time the chime goes off and I prepare myself my eyes are still closed but I prepare myself this time to see if it if it presents itself to me again that I will be more prepared for it and be able to make a more uh, objective observation of whatever it's there to do because I was too startled the first time to even notice those types of details. So I open my eyes and there it is again. But this time I don't flinch. This time I sit and I quietly watch what it's doing. I want to see if I'm truly awake I want to see if I'm still in an altered state of consciousness and I just think I'm awake. I want to make sure that I am in normal consciousness, observing a physical or semi-physical being in this room with me. And I was fully awake. I was fully aware. There was no dreaming. There was no, you know, anything that would be altered consciousness. Nothing. I was perfectly awake as awake as I am right now telling you this story and it was there right above me looking into my eyes to the point that I could see my reflection in its eyes so it would had some kind of corporeality it wasn't like a deep dark blackness as you would expect from a phantom or some type of maybe illusion or hallucination hallucinations typically don't reflect (laughs) light they're not usually that uh, specific but I could see myself because the eyes were so large and it was a classic gray what you would you know the little tiny mouth the two little nostrils without the nose and the giant black eyes the elongated elongated head and the pale gray skin and it was, uh, if I had to guess, maybe seven feet tall. It had to hunch over and look down at me. And it just, sta- it stared at me. I stared back at it. And I wanted to see what it was going to do. Now, keep in mind, this is in Las Vegas at about 2.30 in the afternoon. In a, in, I mean, I'm in a very, I mean, this is not, I didn't live on the, in the out in the desert somewhere. I lived in the city. So, I mean, I'm surrounded by... I'm, I'm in a building with, you know, <laughs> dozens of other people. It was, a, it was a, a condominium complex. And it was there. Looking at me, I'm looking at it. So I just laid there and watched it. It continued to look at me for what I would say was maybe another 15 seconds. 
then it s- slowly s- um, uh, moved to an erect position because remember it was crouching over to look down at me my head turned a little bit to kind of continue to watch it and it went back towards I had the some of the floor plan here so you can understand what what I'm going to say Um, I was in my master bedroom that had an open bathroom Um, so the sink area was open and there was a uh, a large Roman tub to the left and then to the right was a door where the toilet was. And it walked back towards that toilet room, which is like literally this tiny, maybe it at most four feet by two feet. I mean, <laughs> maybe three feet. I mean, it was a tiny little closet of a room, just enough to hold the toilet and shut the door. And it walked back into there and disappeared. Fast forward several months, I leave Las Vegas and we returned, uh, which eventually became a, I guess, semi-permanent because I'm still here. We came to Atlanta, Georgia, and I've been here ever since. And when we moved back here, we stayed because my wife, Tracy, her parents live here. And uh, we stayed with them until we got ourselves settled and situated into our own place and um, settled into new jobs and that type of thing. Um, and so we're back maybe three, man, not even that well, maybe three or four weeks. And I uh, am in the guest room with my wife late at night. And um, this is now about one in the morning. And I'm just, I'm reading, she's asleep. And I finished up the chapter of the book I was reading and closed the book, put it on the nightstand, shut the light. I then was noticing that I was having trouble getting to sleep. So I kind of, sometimes what I do, and I still do this, although I've I've been sleeping very well for the last several months now, so hopefully it continues (laughs) on that way. Um, I noticed... I just leave my eyes open and I'm just kind of like staring at the ceiling or looking around the room. And as my eyes adjusted, I could start to see, you know, how you can see in the dark room some of the shadows and you can kind of get an idea as to what's going on in the room. I started to see movement in the corner of the guest room at the foot of the bed towards the right hand corner of the room. And that catches my eye, sort of in the corner of my eye. So I look over there, and I notice that, and my eyes are not fully adjusted yet, but they're just adjusted enough that I can see movement. And I'm like, what the heck is over there? So at this point, I'm just kind of looking. And my eyes continue to improve. I'm starting to see a little bit better. And now I'm seeing that there are actually two very long, dark figures in the corner of that room. Now, these are to the point that they are so tall that they actually had to crouch. And these were like 10-foot ceilings. So these were very, very tall, more than 10 feet tall. They were crouching in the corner of the room. And again, that startled me. Because I wasn't expecting that. I hadn't had another encounter with this type of thing before. And I had not seen this particular type of thing before. So at this point, I start nudging Tracy. And I'm saying, Tracy, wake up. Tracy, wake up. You need to see this. And she's not waking up. There's nothing I could do to wake her up. I kept jolting her. I kept shaking her. I kept. Ye- I was actually, at this point, probably yelling. And she was not moving. Not making, not flinching. So at this point, I sit up a little bit and I see them and they're just standing there moving ever so slightly watching me. This goes on for about five, ten minutes. And then I can't remember anything that happens after that. 
The next thing I, I remember is lying down, opening my eyes, and once again, seeing one of them crouching over me, staring into my eyes. At that point, I shot awake. I tried to wake up Tracy. She would not move, would not budge, which is kind of unusual. I mean, she's a deep sleeper, but not typically that deep. And I wake up and what was the most interesting thing about this is that I, I could still see the eyes as an after image in my retinal vision. You know how like when you take a flash picture and you can still see the flash for about maybe three or four minutes after this was yeah. like that. I could still see the eyes. Yeah. And it, I, I can honestly say that was something that I have never encountered before. And now I will say that this occurred three more times after that. Almost exactly like I just told you with minor differences, but always sort of happening the same way. Did I, was I abducted? I don't think so. Um, who are these guys? What were they there to do other than just sit there and watch me? Um, I will say there was a period of time where there was a bit of a paralysis experience. Um, but it was very, uh, but I was able to resist it. And maybe that's why they left me alone. I don't know. But I do remember, I remember that when they would look down at me not being able to move and then say, no, this is not going to happen. I'm going to get up. And being able to, at that point, resist the, the temptation. Because it wasn't really like sleep par- I've had sleep paralysis. It wasn't like that. It was more like a suggestion. Don't move. Rather than, it was almost like a compulsion to not move, rather than an inability to move. And it, it, it certainly fascinated me. It really did. Uh, and, it, it, of course, it, it, it opened my, my range of understanding. And this was, again, long before I was an exorcist, long before I ever got involved with this type of work. So um, I wasn't really influenced by it in any way. Or any, I didn't have any preconceived notions about it other than, like I said, that y- those UFO experiences that I talked about earlier. Um, so um, fascinating fascinating stuff um, when I come back from the break here or actually past the top of the hour I th- oh no not quite but we're going to take a little break here and then when I come back um, Joy and I are going to talk a little bit about what she thinks it might be and uh, yeah. then we're going to get into the various realms of thought schools of thought on this particularly how the church looks at it uh, stay tuned, don't go away.
Welcome back, everyone. This is Bishop Brian Willett here with my co-host, Joy Keeling, for Vestiges After Dark. We're talking about aliens. And when we return here in just a moment, we're going to continue the subject and talk about the exotheology involving them, what they might be, what they want, and more. Stay tuned. back everyone um joy uh, you know when we left for the break i finished up on my story there what are your thoughts yeah. on it i mean you you're hearing this for the first time i've never shared this with you before. yeah um what do you think about it wow well you know the the part about how you couldn't wake tracy up it sounds so much like all the stories i've heard where someone was abducted and their spouse was right next to them and, and not waking up because mm-hmm. you hear that over and over again. And I think, you know, I've also, you know, heard the, the part where they couldn't move, but it wasn't because they felt paralyzed, like in a sleep paralysis situation. Yeah. It was one of those things where they were basically told, you know, like they were compelled not to move. It was some kind of telepathic thing. And they thought maybe that was what was happening to whoever was sleeping next to them that wasn't waking up or moving or anything. It definitely was a suggestion. I mean, I can honestly say, having experienced sleep paralysis uh, quite a bit in my college years, which was sort of the precursor, I would actually say that my sleep sleep paralysis was one of the first effects that I encountered um, when I started meditating at a serious level. Before, it was just relaxation techniques and things like that. But as I became more adept and started... Uh, deploying various advanced techniques um, one of the first things that I noticed is that the sleep paralysis happened and it's frightened me because I had never had it before I wasn't even really familiar with it before um, other than as a um, you know a sleep disorder type of thing um, but what really it was and I didn't realize it until I continued to advance in this technique was it was the precursor to lucid dreaming in uh, a new stage of awareness that came with this type of mindfulness meditation that I was doing. Because remember, it's not falling asleep. It's not relaxing. It's not dozing. It's not at all sleep. Your brain is very much awake, but it your consciousness changes to a point where you become almost hyper aware. And Sister Mary Jones said something in the chat room while we were on break um, that I noticed, and I, I liked it. I think it's, I think it's, she's right. She, she said that they, they were trying to decide whether or not to take me because I was not supposed to see them, and yet I was seeing yeah. them. Yeah. I think that's exactly what was going on when you were describing it. That's what it sounded like to me. They probably had not encountered somebody that had that mindfulness um, to the degree that I had cultivated it. Having had, I mean, keep in mind, by the time that this had happened in Las Vegas, I had been meditating at this level for more than eight years. Um, so I was very skilled at. I become very, you know, very uh, adept at it and to the point that, like I said, four hours was was easy. Um, and I'm not boasting. It's just 
it, it, it eventually, I mean, it wasn't easy at first, but I mean, I worked at it, you know, and uh, I really want to say that that mindfulness, being aware of things that were going on, turning off what is called the psychic sensor, this natural filter that, that sort of protects us from the in the what's really going on around us in the universe. Um, it, it becomes it recedes a bit, and you start to see some of what's really present in the universe. And there's a lot more going on around you than you can even possibly imagine. In fact, you know you've heard me say this, and I, other people on the show. I mean, uh, uh, the audience has heard me say this on this show before that every place is actually haunted. It's just we only call it a haunting when it becomes so severe that a person of average awareness can sense it. And that's what's, um, you know, kind of the that, that's what becomes more of the remarkable thing. Well, this is sort of in line with that. Now, let's talk, I guess, about what these things could be. OK, so um, obviously the more biblical, literal denominations out there of Christianity, they almost all see them as demons. They don't have room within their worldview for there being life outside the planet because, like I said at the beginning of the show, Christianity evolved out of a geocentric model. So the idea that you know God created other things that are beyond what we know doesn't fit their biblical literalism because, you know, God created the earth. The Bible doesn't say God created, you know, um, some planet, you know, 25 light years away or more. Um, it talks about just the earth and this is his creation and his relationship to human beings. Um, and of course, original sin. These are all the problems that must be explored in order to get into the exotheology aspects of this field of study, which I find most people or ufologists or people that study alien, abduct, they don't get into exotheology. They tend to come from a more secular worldview or they're coming from uh, a kind of new agey perspective and not many come from the Christian worldview. Fortunately, somebody, I don't know who it was, I think it was you, Bruce, in the chat room, correct me if I'm wrong, asked w what the church's official position is, the Roman Catholic Church, what the official position is on alien life. And um, there really isn't an official position other than to say that the, well, for those of you who might not be aware, the Vatican actually has a very extensive scientific department. Um, and there are many priests that work as scientists within this department. And there is a, a an astronomy department and um, the Vatican astronomer has actually said and the Pope came out with an affirmation of this sentiment uh, that if there's life on other worlds, that does not at all con conflict with any of the truths of salvation. The bigger question which is more of a fascination than it is anything else, is whether or not these beings would need salvation. Did they fall like we did? did? Are they subject to original sin? Did original sin happen in some cosmic condition that affected all of the worlds in the universe? These are questions that exotheologians get into. There aren't really, I and mean, it's not really an actual field there's no such thing as an exotheologian i guess but there are theologians that get into exotheology and i guess you could refer to them as exotheologians if, if informally if nothing else carl sagan was one in a way even though he probably would have uh, objected to that but he did think philosophically about aliens or what that would mean there's a wonderful 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 movie my in fact it's still to this day my favorite movie of all time um, which is Contact um, with Jodie Foster, who is also one of my favorite actresses of all time. And um, she does a remarkable job in this, as she does in most of her um, performances. I think she's really... I wish she was in more stuff, honestly. Um, uh, but she, in Contact, 
uh, plays a, uh, a, a basically a scientist, and um, they, re- they she kind of works for SETI or something like that, and uh, uh, they receive a signal. And I don't know if you've seen this movie. I don't want to give it away to anybody who hasn't seen it. If you haven't seen it, go see it. I think it's on Netflix. So definitely go. You know, even if you only get Netflix for a month to watch it, do it. It's worth it. Um, and, and and basically receive a signal from another world and it gives them the plans to build what essentially is like a stargate which allows um, a person to travel to them across the vast distances but the real interesting part of the movie is not that that's sort of the the red herring in the movie it comes down to whether or not Everything that she experiences when she gets into this device is real. And I don't want to say any more about it if you haven't seen it. But um, again, the whole concept of this movie was how would a definitive alien message or a, you know, a visitation or something that was definitive Definitive. Not this, you know, I see UFOs in the sky. Not this, I've been abducted by alien stuff. We're talking a government announcement. Donald Trump gets on television in an emergency uh, communication to the citizens of the world and says, they have landed. This is, they're here. This is what they want. This is why they're here. Okay, that type of, how would that change our world? How would that affect religion? That's where we're, that's what exotheology is really trying to understand. And some have suggested that it would be devastating to the level of what is known as the Columbian Exchange. Do you guys know what the Columbian Exchange is? Mm, Um, No. The Columbian Exchange is, refers to the ex, the encounters between of ideas between the Native Americas and the Old World in the 15th and 16th century when the explorers went out and made contact with these civilizations for the first time. And in every situation, if, in every scenario, every time this has happened, it's resulted in the destruction of of the more primitive society. So let's look at let's look at ourselves as the primitive society. I know we don't tend to see ourselves this way because in our world, in our egocentric, geocentric concept, we're at the top of the food chain. Human beings, you know, first world human beings see themselves as quite sophisticated. We got all this cool technology. Look at all the things we can do. But let's assume for a moment that, you know, if there really is are if there really are aliens out there who have the technology to visit us and understand this, that's no easy thing to accomplish. We know that there's certain physical laws that to our knowledge cannot be broken, like the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. And there's no topping that and there's actually no matching that. So the best you might be able to achieve is 99.9% of the speed of light, but you could never actually reach the speed of light. Well, there goes my ideas for warp drive. (laughs) I know. Star Trek makes it seem so easy. (laughs) (laughs) But um, to our knowledge of physics, that's not possible. So it, it would have to be some kind of interdimensional thing, wormhole type of thing, perhaps, but only theoretical. There's nothing concrete that could ever explain how they could get there from the vast distances because even the closest world that we know of, and now we've found so many exoplanets. The, you know, this was it, it, 10 years ago. We really were clueless, but now we know there's thousands and thousands and thousands of planets in the inhabitable zone of their own stars that are the same size as Earth and have uh, oxygen atmospheres that are, you know, compatible with life or at least atmospheres that are compatible with life at least as far as we know life to be 
but they're so far away that even if we were to try to reach them with our technology, it would be generate. It would have to be a generation ship. It would be like the people that actually set out to go there would never actually see it. It would be like their great great grandkids or something that would finally maybe arrive there. Assuming that would even be possible. So, how do they? How would they get here? Okay, if they really are, if they're really out there. Um, and so think of us as the primitive society. Let's get back to that Columbian exchange idea. Let's say we're, let's say we're the primitive society. Um, here's the problem, okay? Joy, you and I, let's say you, you, know, you come down to visit me here in Atlanta, and we go and have some really, really good Chinese food. And after that, we go back and we maybe set out a fire outside at the fire pit, and we sit around, and I share with you a wonderful bottle of 1963 vintage port. That's my favorite year. It's by, by most standards, 1963 was the best year for port perhaps ever. I was fortunate enough to have a bottle of this um, many years ago. I don't currently have one, but let's say I did. Um, they're kind of hard to come by these days, and they tend to fetch very high prices, amounting to six or seven, maybe even $8,000. Um, but it's, uh, let's just say I have one and in my wine cellar and I say, okay, let's go out after this wonderful Chinese meal. Let's open up a bottle of port 1963 and let's sit and just talk about the things that you and I talk about philosophy, religion, that type of thing, (laughs) you know? And so we're sitting around and we're enjoying this wonderful port and you're, you're, you know, you're, you're savoring it. You, you, you're, you definitely, your palate can wrap itself around the wonders of this extremely rare beverage that might be a a once-in-a-lifetime experience. You might never have the opportunity to even try this again. But while we're talking back and forth and drinking this wonderful port, we look down and we see a little trail of ants um, sort of walking around the fire pit by us. And so we say, in our great capacity of compassion... It's not fair that only you and I, Joy, get to experience this 1963 port. I think these ants should have a little taste of it, too. So let's pour them a little bit. If we were to do that, um, the best case scenario is that it will only kill a few of them. Because there is no way that the ants in themselves are compatible with 1963, 1963 vintage port. It's just, it's, you pour that out, it's going to kill them. Although okay. I'm sitting here trying to picture a drunk ant. A drunk ant, yeah, well, I mean, it's basically, I, I, I guess in, I've dropped a glass of wine on an ant hill once and I've watched them um, sort of scramble and die. Um, <laughs> so I, I have a little bit of experience. Unfortunately, it wasn't 1963 port, but it was a good wine, and it did bother me. <laughs> um, so ants and wine don't get along very well. But, you know, let's assume for a moment that, that you know, we did this. It, it would kill them, okay, because I know it would kill them. I've seen it happen. And even if it didn't kill them, there's no way that their intellectual capacity would allow them to even understand what is so special about a 1963 port wine. They, they couldn't get it. They wouldn't be able to grasp it. It's going to be just sugar water to, the, to them at best. Okay. Um, so let's say we get up and we're like, you know, telling the ants, why can't you enjoy this? Why aren't you savoring this wonderful thing that we're sharing with you? And then they're feeling all of the vibrations of our movements around them, and they're now running like hell because they think some kind of threat's in the area. They just saw a bunch of them die because some red substance got poured on them, and they run off terrified. How is that any different than if a civilization that was as vastly superior to us as we are to ants were to try to share some of their reality with us. Likely, 
it would kill us or at best scare the hell of a hell out of us to the point that we would no longer be able to function. And that's kind of what I suspect is going on here. And I'm going to get a little too, I don't usually share opinions. Um, but there are sometimes when you request subject matter that, you know, is outside of my normal range of expertise, the best I can give you is an educated contention based upon my knowledge of the field and being, you know, uh, somewhat of an authority, I guess, in paranormal subject matter. When it comes to aliens, this is, this is my contention. And it's only a contention, okay? But I think it's a very well-founded contention, and I think it, it holds much merit. I think the reason why we have never had an, uh, an official um, visitation is because of this ant metaphor. I think to a certain degree... We are maybe amusing to watch for five seconds. Kind of like we might watch ants doing something for a few minutes and then we get bored and move on back to our lives. No one's going to, unless you're really into bugs, you're probably not going to sit there with with great uh, enthusiasm watching ants do what ants do. I mean, fascinating though they are, um, you know, gets a little old after a while. Well, I mean, that's because we're so intellectually advanced. We need more stimulation than what their behavior can give us. Well, that's probably kind of how an advanced civilization would look at us. So that's number one. Number two, if they were to try to share some of their reality with us, it would likely bode poorly for us. And they know this. Just like we would know if you poured, you know, a glass of wine on an anthill, it's probably going to kill them all, or at least the ones that are on the surface. So why do it? And then you're wasting the wine. So why would you do that? And those resources are best preserved for those who can appreciate them, which is number two. So I think this, is ex- this explains why we haven't had an, enc- uh, an official encounter and why any encounters that are being reported out there tend to be somewhat vague or personal or ambiguous. And yeah. only because I've had my own experiences when my been have I been able to really come forward and say, well, there is something to this. Sorry, Joy, you, you were going to say something. Oh, um, yeah, I was going to say, you know, one of the things someone mentioned Star Trek and, and actually mentioned Gene Roddenberry. Um, I don't know if you've heard the uh, uh, rumors going around that he met alien beings and that's what inspired Star Trek and especially the Prime Directive. And that's the explanation they give in this conspiracy theory or whatever it is that the aliens had this idea of a Prime Directive and he put that into the show because they won't reach out to us because we're not ready. Because we're just not advanced enough to be able to interact with them. And I don't know. I mean, it's it's one of those things that you see on YouTube. It's interesting, but it's it's one of those ideas that makes you think, you know, is that why they're not reaching out? Because we're not advanced enough and they could hurt us I, without meaning to? I, I think it is. I, I mean, I think there is something to that. Whether or not it's specifically what we're saying, you know, I guess there's room for flexibility there. But overall, I think we're we're hitting the ballpark on this. And honestly, when you look at all the movies and what is in mass consciousness about, you know, another good movie we talked about, Contact, another great one, um, is Knowing with, um, um, oh gosh, uh, Sister Maximilian, if you're out there in the chat room, remind me. Oh, Nicolas Cage just came to me. Nicolas Cage, The Knowing. Or no, it's just called Knowing. Uh, came out back in um, 2006 or seven. Fantastic movie. Also, um, definitely worth watching. And 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 it, and one of the things that it leads one to suspect is that are we being prepared for such an encounter? Are we sort of? Is it being normalized in our mass consciousness through movies and 
books and various other types of fictions that we are comfortable exploring because it's not perceived as reality. Uh, are we being groomed in a way for the official encounter that's to come so that it's so part of us that when it, when it does happen, the devastating effects won't be so severe as what we see with the Colombian exchange and how that literally wiped out the civilizations to the point that, you know, I mean, I mean, horrible thing, not just disease and everything else, but I mean, philosophically how it damaged them, you know, the missionaries coming to change their religion, all of these things that happen when more advanced civilizations come in and, and take control. Um, now, there is another aspect to this from the realm of the occult that's worth exploring. And um, Aleister Crowley conducted an experiment, one of his various conjurations. He was a ceremonial magician. Um, some consider him to be the most uh, sinister uh, occultist of our time. And um, I, I think some of that was just reputation and uh, exaggerated. Well, well, he called himself the Beast, so I'm yeah. guessing, well, he, you know, it was self-promotion. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and he liked it. His father was a very strict um, uh, Protestant pastor, and I think he just grew to hate conventional religion to a degree that he was going to grow up and do everything that it condemned. Um so he was, you know, uh, I think he was a very unapologetic uh, and very promiscuous bisexual. Um, he did he did everything that he could do to stick his f middle finger up at conventional f uh, religion. And, yeah, calling himself the beast would have been part of that. And um, but I mean, he probably wasn't any n anywhere near as sinister as we tend to reflect on uh, uh, on about him. Um, but he was a brilliant occultist, a fantastic poet, actually, and, and really a genius in his own right, um, at least in, in terms of what he gave to the field of Western occultism. And um, so he did a lot of experiments. And one of the things that he was very meticulous about was the recording of every experiment that he would perform. And uh, he would write the details out in, in painstaking detail. I mean, if you ever read some of his writing, it's very um, verbose. It's, 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 it's very thick writing. You really almost have to kind of like take each sentence three or four times. And even then you're kind of wondering if you fully got or grasped what he was trying to tell you. Yeah, that was a, it was a common writing style of his time. It was, yeah. It was part of it was that part of it was. I think he was just very. He was stuck on himself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very, very true. Um, but one of the things that he did in 1918, I believe it was, was he had he did a conjuration in which he encountered a being that he called Lam. He actually called it the Lama but it's now referred to as Lam. And uh, he drew, he was actually an, a, a, a fairly decent artist, and he drew a sketch, or rather he sketched out a representation of what this being looked like. And he called it the Demon Lam, or the Lama, he would refer to it that way. But what's, Remarkable about this are two things. Number one, he wrote no details down as to how he made contact with this thing, which is completely out of characteristic for him. Unchar rather, uncharacteristic of him, rather, sorry. And number two, he, what he sketched looks like an alien gray. Almost perfectly. Look it up on Google. Just Google uh, Alistair Crowley's LAM, L-A-M, and you'll see pictures of it. Um, and a lot of people have suspected that the rise in alien activity starting in the 30s and f well, mostly the 40s, I guess, with, with, the, with the Roswell incident 
which, you know, fast forward a few years, seems kind of interesting that the computer age and the age of the transistor happened very soon after Roswell. I'm no, I'm no conspiracy theorist. In fact, I kind of get frustrated with conspiracy theories, but I have to agree that that is a little bit more than a coincidence. Even Star Trek, we've talked about Star Trek. Star Trek Voyager even did a two-part episode <laughs> on this very thing. Only instead of an alien ship, it was a time ship from, I think, the 27th century that uh, somehow got into conflict with Voyager and, um, and um, ended up in the 1990s. And uh, all of the this this um, I guess sort of um, Bill Gate a uh, Bill Gates type um, gets the gets access to the ship and then reverse engineers things and starts creating all this new technology becomes a multi billionaire off of it. Mm. Uh, it's a good episode of Star Trek, uh, also on um, Netflix if you guys are interested in it. But um, it has been suggested that Alistair Crowley might have un- opened up a dimension to these beings and was unable to close this gateway. Uh, and perhaps that's why, being ashamed of it, he never recorded what transpired. It's a, it's, a, it's a theory, it's a s- suggestion, but it's interesting to think about because it is the first time in modern history that we see a representation of a gray. You don't see them really in any other time period. There's been some art from the Renaissance of UFOs. Um, you know, there's been some petroglyphs and various things the, that look like it could be, if you kind of stretch your imagination a little bit, it could be a great alien. But nothing to the detail of Crowley, Crowley's um, sketch. Did that unlock the, the age of UFOs and alien abductions? It's definitely something that's interesting to think about and consider. Well, here's another thing to consider if we're going to talk about abductions. There are stories going back hundreds of years about fairy abductions, where people were abducted by fairies or even abducted by jinn, depending on what part of the world you're in. And there are people who think that those are actually early stories of alien abductions. Of course, then there are other people who think that aliens are really just jinn or fairies that have shapeshifted and are abducting people and now they look like this. But I, I think it's I, I think it's more a matter of how we perceive them because of yeah. where we're located in in our lives. You know, we may think it's an alien, we may think it's a fairy, but there's something abducting people. <laughs> Oh, and that no, this has been going on forever. There's no question. There's no question that there's something out there that is accountable to this this report. Like I said, I've had clients, many clients that have come forward and reported to me what is definitely more in line with an alien abduction than a demonic event. Um, and it's to the degree that I can't ignore it. And then having had my own personal experiences has even further lended credibility because now I'm not just having to take people's word for it. I've seen these things. And I was also in a state of meditation. Now, I wasn't doing conjurations like Crowley was, but I was definitely doing some very high-level meditation uh, that would not be um, suggested to a layman or, or somebody that had not at least reached a certain point in their praxis to be able to do these things. Um, And I mean, I was definitely peeking into worlds. There's no question about that. Are these beings from other planets? That's one possibility. Are these beings interdimensional, which I think is more in line with my contention or some other higher intelligence that's indigenous to this planet? Could it be that they are terrestrial? 
we just don't necessarily have uh, access to the level of intellect that's required to in, to understand them. Just like the ants again. Go back to the ants. You know, when you move around, they feel those vibrations. They think it's some kind of imminent danger. They run. They do the flight or flight response that's common to all creatures. Um, you know, how do we know that some of the things that happen in our planet that we write off as natural phenomena are not being instigated by the movements of these higher beings that we just are not compatible enough with to experience at their level to the point that we would know they're even there. An ant doesn't even know you're there. If you stay completely still, they don't even know you're there. They just go on about their business and they don't even realize you. And how often is that happening to us? Could there could they just be higher intelligences that are natural to the planet Earth? That's another possibility to consider. Um, but I, I tend to think the interdimensional makes the most sense. Now, I reject some people are talking in the chat room, although my chat room has frozen on me again. I don't understand why it freezes at, at about an hour and a half into the show. I don't it, hmm. it's been doing that, but I'm still scrolling. Well, it's, uh, I'll have to depend upon you because I, uh, okay. I can't read it anymore. The last one I got was Bruce asking if those aliens uh, were demons in physical form. Um, yeah, and you know, uh, uh, Sister Mary Joan also mentioned that she had heard reports of people calling out to Jesus uh, and being, you know, delivered from the aliens. I've heard stories like that as well where somebody was in the middle of being abducted from their bed with their spouse asleep next to them, and then they cry out, you know, Jesus, protect me, and they're dropped back on the bed. And that's an interesting element to the entire discussion, because what does that, you know, what does that mean? Well, I, I think, first of all, I'm going to start, I'm going to stay right off the bat. I don't think aliens are demons at all. I think sometimes there are demons um, that might have the physical or arch let me be very careful about what I say the archetypal configuration that is similar to what we might consider a demon but I don't think these grays I don't think what I saw what I described in the first hour of the show I don't think what I saw were demons they were too analytical and I've, uh, believe me, I've seen demons. I've encountered them. I, I deal with them on a regular basis. That's part of my job. I have seen them with my own eyes. I've experienced them in very intimate ways. And what I saw in Vegas, what I saw when I returned to Georgia, that was no demon. It was something else. And I've encountered ele elementals in this work. And we've talked about the four types of demons, you know, the yeah. the fallen angels the the created the elementals and the wrathful spirits these what i saw what i encountered the behavior of these things were unlike any of those four characteristics this is something completely different i reject the i really think this is just a bias in christianity because they don't have a language to discuss anything that happens off the planet the entire theology is built upon geocentrism so if you if your planet is the center of the universe and you're the, the the epitome of God's creation as a human being as a Homo sapien, um, then there doesn't really leave much room for there being higher beings out there uh, or other worlds where perhaps they're far more evolved and sophisticated. Even evolution is something that a lot of Christian denominations struggle with. Um, but you know if there is a you know if there's we've been on this planet, um, you know we start to get to our current look about a million and a half years ago, but this planet's been here for billions of years. What would have happened if there were, there was a planet out there in the universe that's been there for twice as long and had a intelligent species like Homo sapien that's been on the planet twice as long, three million years instead of a million and a half. How would they have evolved? How much more sophisticated would their technology be? 
then you start getting into the questions of, again, going back to original sin. How pervasive is original sin? Is it a universal problem or is it an earth problem? Is it a all <coughs> creation problem or is it a species problem? Is it only hum- homo sapien? Well, we can answer some of this through inferring, <laughs> philosophical inference. And um, one thing we can look at is, well, number one, the universe is entropic. Entropy is really the scientific term to explain the fallen universe because um, things don't get don't things don't go from poor states to improved states things break down okay so you know you build a sandcastle uh, my my students have heard me say this so many times um, it's almost done like a broken record but the uh, this audience probably hasn't heard me say it too many times <laughs> but um <laughs> you know you build a sandcastle and um you know, it's not going to be better the next day. M- you know, it's not going to get larger. You're not going to have like an even bigger castle that's even more sophisticated. Uh, it's going to erode. It's going to be, it might even wash away. It might blow away through the wind. It's not going to get better. So things go from, f- from, from states of order to increasing states of disorder. That's entropy. Energy burns out. It doesn't, energy doesn't get stronger. So it's not like, you know, you go from, you start out hungry and then you automatically keep getting more and more energy just by existing. No, you, you, you take in food and then the energy wears out and then you have to take in more food again and the energy wears out. And this is also what explains death because our cells are wearing out each time they have to regenerate. And as they regenerate, they get less and less um, capable of doing what they were designed to do and that's uh, ultimately what leads to aging and death that's entropy that causes that but we know from theology that original sin the consequence of it was death so you could almost say if you want to get more scientific about this that what the Bible is really saying is that whatever original sin was and i mean on honestly let's be really here i'm not a biblical literalist most catholics are not um adam and eve were probably not actual human beings in the sense that we are and the tree of knowledge of good and evil was most likely not a tree and the fruit that they ate was most likely not a fruit it's a metaphor for something that happened that is beyond our understanding Something that happened at a a level of reality that we are no longer compatible with and we cannot possibly understand. So we have this metaphor, this story to tell so that we can kind of understand it. It's like Jesus in the parables. He's not telling the parables because he's trying to record history. His parables are not recorded history. All right. The, 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 you know, the, the, um, the lost sheep is not a, um, a real event. It's a metaphor for how, God relates to us or some kind of ineffable thing. And the story of Adam and Eve, it should be taken that way. So we don't know what kind of reality that is, but we do know whatever it was that uh, the original sin was, which is not eating fruit, I can tell you that. Um, But it definitely had something to do with cultivating an awareness that now gave us access to making the wrong decision. It somehow wrecked how the universe works and so we went from an immortal creature to what is now a creature that grows old gets sick and dies does this happen everywhere in the universe as far as we know the entire universe that we can see is entropic animals die they didn't commit original sin we don't even refer to them in theology as having committed or inherited original sin Scripture pretty much pins it only on human beings and only human beings are worthy of salvation, right? If you're looking at it strictly theologically, but yet why are animals subject to the same consequence that Adam and Eve were that brought death into the world? So why aren't they eligible for salvation too? It begs the question, doesn't it? But overall... We have to ask, how does this apply to aliens? Do they need a Jesus? And if they do, did Jesus, did Jesus 
appear incarnate on their worlds in much the same way that he did with ours? And did they draft their own theology of salvation based upon that? Or are they so sophisticated that they needed an entirely different type of connection to the divine that would lead to the equivalent of salvation? These are the things that exotheology questions and wonders about. These are the things that ultimately leave us pondering. Bruce asked about what the official stance is. I don't think I ever really gave it. I was talking about, I went in that direction. We were talking about the Vatican astronomers yeah. and what, you know, essentially the official position is, is that it does not, and I did say this, it does not conflict with anything that we know to be the, the truths of salvation. And where Protestantism, or not so much Protestantism, but maybe the more fundamentalist type of denominations or the more literal biblical literalists that, must believe in creationism, must accept, must think that, you know, the, the universe was created in six rotations around the sun. Um, or in that rather, I'm sorry, six rotations of the planet. <laughs> Not six years, six, yeah. six days. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is what happens when I get a little, <laughs> it gets late. <laughs> My brain starts yeah. to break down. Didn't have enough coffee this night, uh, tonight. But um, no, um, six rotations of the planet. Uh, what they're going to struggle with is this idea that um, that everything pertains to earth and it's not in the Bible so it doesn't exist. So the Bible doesn't talk about aliens so aliens can't exist. They must be demons. But what they fail to understand is that the Bible is only a user's manual for salvation. That's it. That's all it does. There is not an ounce of data more than what is needed to bring a fallen human being into the grace of God to achieve salvation. That's it. It doesn't talk about aliens or other planets or any other things that God did because that's not relevant to human salvation. So the Roman Catholic Church sees it this way. And they have no problem. Just like they have no problem with evolution, they, 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 a lot of Catholic priests get a lot get a lot of flack for this. Now, Bruce is talking about, and again, this is the last thing I can read in my chat. But Bruce says, you know, any chance those uh, that those aliens were demons in physical form? I'm writing this because many Roman Catholic exorcists think that aliens and UNF UFOs actually are just tricks <coughs> from the devil. He says, "P.S. I'm sorry. I know my English sucks, but I'm from Italy. I think your English is remarkably good, Bruce. So do not." I feel had no bad idea about. Bruce was not. A native English speaker. <laughs> no, I mean honestly, his English is better than than, than some English speakers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People and write you know, me all sorts of things, and I'll tell you, Bruce, you are very very articulate. So don't feel bad about your writing. And he elaborated on uh, on Twitter. Uh -huh. Um, it says, you know, I don't know if you read this on Spreaker chat, so I'll post it here. Also, uh, back in the seventies, eighties, there was an exorcist named Giuseppe Tomaselli. Uh, here in Italy, he wrote many books about interviewing demons during the exorcisms. One of these demons named Ash Astorth uh, told him that all UFOs and the aliens are just demons creating illusions to trick human minds and to keep people away from the church. That's very weird to me. If he was lying during an exorcism, well, that's even weirder. Gosh, a demon lying during an exorcism? Yeah. Does that ever happen? <laughs> all the time. Um, <laughs> they will say anything and everything to, to, to throw you off or to distract you from what your purpose is. One of the first rules that you learn when you are studying to be an exorcist, the first thing is to never pay any heed to anything the demon says. You don't talk to it. You don't converse with it. Uh, only to agitate it. There are certain provisions that you are allowed to do to agitate it sort of throw back its bullshit back at it and so there are certain times where you can even weaken it by you distracting it doing the very thing that it's trying to do to you but you never get it sometimes demons will they'll know the sins you've committed they'll start you know listing them off to you while you're trying to perform the the exorcism to make you feel weak 
or to make you feel like you're not a- that you're you're too evil to e- you're not holy enough um you know to distract you f- from the work but you know any exorcist always keeps in mind any at least any decent one always keeps in mind that it's Christ who's the exorcist you're the facilitator it doesn't matter how holy you are you can be the worst sinner on the planet and still successfully perform an exorcism as long as you completely surrender over to Christ um so no I would not take anything a demon says in an exorcism or any any time the exorcism or not I would never take anything a demon says and say that you know this is valuable information um because all they do is lie in fact most of the time they don't even know the their their own things that they're talking about they make things up as they go along and they just spew whatever they can spew um so i wouldn't put any value into that now as far as whether or not i think they're demons i've already said i do not i think they're interdimensional beings not necessarily from other worlds um but just like the roman catholic church you know even tibetan buddhism and the mahayana buddhists uh have a uh, a, uh an understanding within their theological framework that would allow for there being other worlds there's something in Mahayana Buddhism called the Pure Lands. And these are seen to be, in Buddhist cosmology, actual planets. Places that you can reincarnate to that are far better than here if you can advance enough. And if you can make it to a Pure Land, uh, then the Buddhas that live there, that reside there, will be able to get you to enlightenment within the next lifetime. This is actually all part of very conventional Mahayana Buddhist theology, or at least cosmology. I don't know if you can really consider it a theology, but it is definitely a cosmology. And, you know, honestly, it works for uh, how we are looking at this kind of almost Star Trek type view of the cosmos, where there's many worlds. And how can we think that we're the only ones? I mean, how can we think that that's all, that's egocentric within itself to think that, you know, Out of all of this in the universe, the the unimaginable vastness of space, it's beyond comprehension. All right. Remember, the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. I want to say, correct me out there if I'm wrong, but I want to say the Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years from end to end, if I'm not mistaken. That's how the Muddy Python song goes. So I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a uh, song for that. <laughs> I, well, then I guess it's true. <laughs> Monty Python I'm, might I'm be a little bit more credible than a demon, right? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> so, or at least they're completely different. Yes, yes. <laughs> so if you've got 100,000 light years from, from one end of the Milky Way galaxy to the other, just our galaxy alone, it would take you 100,000 years at 186,000 miles per second to get from one end to the other. That's just this galaxy. And then there's billions of galaxies beyond out there that we can see. Billions and billions of them. Um, you can't tell me that we're the only living things or the only intelligent living things in, in, in that level of space it's just not even practical to think that way statistically it would be impossible all right so do aliens exist yeah i think they do are grays aliens probably not they're probably interdimensional being something that is definitely more sophisticated than us but perhaps not necessarily from another realm or i mean at least another world but perhaps from another realm. I don't think they are demons um, because they don't behave like demons, at least not my encounters, did not behave like anything I've ever seen a demon do or behave like. Um, This was a very analytical and technological type of experience. It it was nothing like anything I've encountered with a demon, which is more animalistic. Demons are very much like trying to tame a wild beast. It has... these, These creatures were very calm and cold and just emotionless and demons are not emotionless demons are very wrathful they're angry there was none of that coming from these guys um i've never seen a demon behave like that even the most the most serious ones um now this is something different something completely different entirely um and you know alien is the word that we use whether or not it is i don't know um 
let's go ahead and get to some questions. So I um, imagine there's a lot out there that I'm not seeing and maybe some that I've missed. So, um, Joy, what do you got out there? Well, uh, there were some questions in the chat room. One person asked, do you think aliens are made by God? Yeah, I, I think that um, I do think that the same God does govern the entire cosmos. I think that part of the story that we get from the book of Genesis is absolutely literal. I don't think there's any question about that. I don't think there's other gods out there that are competing with the one that we have, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't, there, there's one God um, that is superior. Now, there's many things that are like in the realm of gods and goddesses that are below that one God. There's no question to me about that. Um, you know, I get into, I get a lot of flack when I say that the pagan deities are real. Um, you know, because most Roman Catholics, most Christians do not accept that. But, you know, work in this field with me for a little bit and you'll start <laughs> to see things a little bit differently. Just um, hang out with me for a little bit. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I know you know. And, you know, I, it's weird it, things just happen around me. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have some encounters from something. <laughs> of course. Of course. And, you know, uh, but this is not the you know Zeus, Athena, you know are not competing with Yahweh, all right. This is I like to explain it this way. While the reason that it was blasphemy, or or I should say, um, uh, a type of blasphemy, to worship other gods, okay, where you get into idolatry and other types of grave sins. Um, when there was the one God worship, no God, but me is what the commandment says. And then you, you had the temple where, you know, most temples in the ancient world had large structures, right? Um, where the, the representation of the deity would rest on top of the, the, the pillar. Well, in the Jewish temple, there was a pillar, but it was empty because God, this God was beyond representation, could not be represented in any physical way, which is why graven images were a problem because you could not represent, it would be, you would be trivializing, minimizing God to even try to represent him. That only became viable after the incarnation, which is why now we have icons and statues and various other types of religious art because Jesus incarnated... God became man, and so now we had something that we could use as a representation that was appropriate. That's where that whole thing, that's how that's all reconciled, because I know a lot of, you know, some fundamentalists criticize the Catholic Church for the art. They don't understand this theology part of it, but, you know, that's, you know, now you know. So now you can tell them and hopefully correct them. So you had just this one god but so so who is athena who is zeus I, isn't it interesting when you when you look at the greek and roman gods and goddesses they all were of something venus the goddess of love right um mars the god of war um what the problem is in paganism, why Christians could not stand pagans, other than the fact that pagans persecuted them relentlessly, and rightfully so, because they were, you know, here's this little minority religion uh, coming out of this little minority part of their empire, and it's taken over. I mean, you, you'd feel threatened if that, I mean, as a Christian, you'd feel threatened if something like that happened to you, um, and you wouldn't stand for it. So they didn't either. Um, but the reason it was such a problem to the theology is because Zeus and Mars and all of these characters from pag the pagan world are the powers of God. So Mars was the embodiment, the personification of God's wrath. V Athena was the embodiment the, the embodiment of God's love and compassion. We're not supposed to worship the power of God, the powers of God. We're supposed to worship God. And so in a way, you could say that this monotheism from the Jewish world was a very sophisticated model 
that would become the, the, the framework for which we would go forward. Hinduism, which is actually one of the oldest organized religions, if not the o oldest organized religion on the planet. In fact, some Hindu texts go back, you know, or Hindu um, concepts go back 10,000 years, which would truly make it the oldest, even older than some of the more primal forms of religion, um, understands this. Because you have, in Hinduism, you have Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, which is sort of their trinity. But all of them, and the hundreds of thousands of deities that emanate out from those three, all come from Brahman, which is the truly the one God. So in a way, you know, people look at Hinduism as being mono, uh, um, um, polytheistic. It's actually monotheistic entirely. It's just they recognize that God has many emanations, God being Brahman. And who are we? We are a reflection of Brahman, and that's referred to as Atman. Okay? So all these gods and goddesses and all these guys, they're the powers of God. So that's why I say that they're real. Because, yes, they do. God is, is so sophisticated in such a way that even his very actions can become conscious and even become beings and entities in and of themselves doesn't mean we should worship them but it doesn't mean we need to be afraid of them either or shun them it means that we should understand them and being an exorcist in the kind of work that i do this is necessary this is essential to my work because sometimes we do encounter these things and we have to know how to deal with them and you don't perform an exorcism on zeus that would be stupid <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. Yeah, but it, I mean, these are things that we do encounter. So no, I don't. I don't see aliens as being into that. So you know, like the ancient aliens and all this stuff, where they viewed as like they're they were like sophisticated creatures that came to this planet and everyone started worshiping them because primitive man thought they were gods. I don't even buy that story. I yeah, don't. <laughs> I, I I don't buy it either. But it's it's fun because they follow the same pattern with every new thing that they approach, it's the same pattern. And yeah. I, I'm just waiting for one of them to excavate a, a Walmart parking lot and go, well, you see these person, you know, this person over here, this burial ground, this uh, person sitting on the sun. Oh, no, that's that's actually the handicap parking. <laughs> They're not sitting on the sun. That's a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's the same you know they they the way they distort it it's this yeah. same there's actually a video that i found on youtube um and it's a documentary it's like a i think a two-hour documentary that actually uh goes back and refutes everything they're saying based on you know logic not uh it's basically taking their argument and picking the argument itself apart uh, rather than because a lot of times they'll just set up a straw man argument and say, yeah. well, obviously this is the only solution. And then it, it takes that and kind of dissects the pattern that they use to come up with their theories. Right, and I think right. that's really true. I'll share that on Twitter. If anybody wants to see it. Yeah. Um, please do. I think it would be, you know, definitely be interesting. I think to some of us, uh, some out there listening tonight, we probably have time for, one more question, perhaps. Um, you have a good one there? Um, yeah, you know, there was uh, one question here. Uh, Jesse asked if it uh, it makes me wonder if we pray, will God protect us from these or are these his creation and it's part of his plan for us to meet? Yeah, and I think this gets back to what others were saying about why um calling upon Jesus Christ has seemed to help in some situations with this type of phenomenon. It's not because they're demons. Okay. It ha it's, it's because God is going to protect you from anything that would be disturbing to you, even if it's not necessarily something malevolent. Um, God does protect his own. He really does. Even from simple little things, the more you cultivate that relationship, the more you develop a relationship with God, which requires grace, by the way. It's not something you can go and do it alone. It's something that you must cultivate through the faculties of the church and relationship with your fellow men and women. Um, 
is how you develop that relationship with God and, 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 and those that have a sophisticated relationship with God. Yes, God will protect them about anything that disturbs you. So there's nothing at all unusual to me, at least, about an alien encounter or some kind of person having a, an abduction experience and then calling out Jesus name and it somehow stops it. Um, because, you know, there are people that have been in life, very mundane life threatening situations that have called on Jesus and have been pulled out of those situations. Um, you know, you could even say, uh, well, sister Mary Joan gave us a great story. Um, when she was, on uh, vestiges of Christianity a few episodes ago when she talked about her accident and the kind of experiences that she had there, um, you know, were because of the sophistication of her spirituality. Uh, and so, yeah, God does do protect us from anything so that, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything um, unusual about that. And I don't think that that is proof positive that, you know, these things are demons because God protects you from more than just demons. Um, look at, uh, you know, Daniel and the lion, you know, I mean, there's an example, <laughs> you know, God does, um, does Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, oh gosh, I, I, is there, is there one good one? We can do maybe one more. Um, one more good one. <clears throat> there was one about, uh, can mediums see aliens? I was watching dead files and Amy said there was aliens or beings out of this world attacking the family. I, I, I don't see why mediums couldn't see a, alien stuff going on. A lot of the reports of aliens talks about uh, telepathic communication and, you know, the powers of mental suggestion. And, of course, where mediums are getting their information from, a lot of it is from the same location where you would use that telepathy. So, of course, you know, if the if an entity like that were to show up, which of course now I'm, I'm kind of freaked out. What if one shows up <laughs> uh, now that you know what to look for? You're, you're, you might yeah. be tuned into that frequency, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, and I know, Hey, meditating worked for you. Should I be meditating over here? There might be an alien. There's lots of aliens in Colorado. Either that or, <laughs> either that or it's think... the air force Academy. I've known people who go there and they do have experimental planes. So we do have a yeah. little bit of both. I think, I think um, as long as you're there's... not doing the very specific types of mindfulness techniques that I was doing, you probably will be okay. But I think you are right on target there. Yes, there's no question yeah. that a medium could because what a, what is a medium? A medium is just n somebody that is able to tune into more frequencies than what an average yeah. person can tune into. Exactly. And things that you can't see or things that you don't normally encounter, things that we would classify as paranormal, like ghosts or demons or angels or a aliens or elementals, anything within that spectrum that's outside of the normal range of consciousness. The reason that these particular people are able to see or encounter or, in or, or even communicate with these things is because they're tapping into the very resonance frequency that those particular beings um, vibrate at. And yeah. that makes them compatible for just that moment, just enough to have an exchange. Especially um, if, if they're interdimensional. Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, because, I mean, even I find it interesting that Crowley referred to Lom as the demon. Yeah. Yet it looked like an alien. So even Crowley, with all of his sophistication and, and, and occult genius and like him or hate him. OK, he was a, a cult genius. There's no question. You cannot take that away from him. Um, even with all of his skill, he did not have in his worldview in back in 1918 enough of a concept to say, well, maybe this was a visitation from another planet. Um, he saw it within the framework of what could be conjured in the magical world and demons would have been a. a likely possibility to somebody of that time period just as they are today i mean because like what are we talking about here people are asking are they demons in disguise pretending oh no i don't think so that was a very elaborate and almost pointless type of deception when you think about it i mean why the ufos and everything i mean really what are we what are they accomplishing here well maybe um, they're pulling a prank <laughs> yeah, i mean <laughs> 
I that would be the only thing that I could maybe concede and say that's what's going on here. But um, honestly, I don't think that uh, even even that would be um, enough <laughs> to say it is what you know. Well, it's they're not demons. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we're at the end of the show, guys. It's been a wonderful evening spending this with you. And thank you, Joy, for your input and, and, and dedication uh, to helping me make this such a great show for everybody. I really, really appreciate you as well. Um, we'll not going to be here next week, okay? I'm going to be unavailable for the next um, t- uh, about uh, 10 days. Um, so I'll be still checking in on Twitter occasionally but not very often so if i'm slow um with with anything don't think i'm ignoring you it's just because i've got some things that i need to take care of and i don't want distractions during that period of time um so this show will we, we're not gonna have a show next week okay but we'll be back uh, most likely the following week with a vestige probably do another vestiges after dark um Think about some topics that you guys want us to cover. Tell us on Twitter, and we'll go ahead and set that up. All right? God bless you all. Take care, and we'll see you in two weeks.